الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I hope everyone is doing well We had quite a long break uh, I hope that has not decreased our zeal and fervor to attend the classes and gain knowledge, inshallah. So the previous lesson that we did have, we spoke and we began the, the second hadith of the Arba'een of Imam al-Nawawi. And we spoke about the background. And I think we can start off by just going over that again, just to be a, a reminder. So inshallah, I will translate that again. And I won't really read the Arabic. I will just translate, inshallah. So this hadith that we see in front of us is basically what is in Arba'in Nawawi. But as we did in the previous lesson, there was some information that was uh, in Sahih Muslim. So this hadith is from Sahih Muslim. And there was some background information. So I'll just translate that. <clears throat> Again, this is the first hadith of Sahih Muslim after his introduction. So Yahya bin Amur, who is a tabi'i, he says uh, that the first person to speak about Qadr in Basra was Ma'bad al-Juhani. So Qadr meaning uh, fate. So someone who started a new, uh, you know, uh, a new trend uh, is actually a bid'ah, an innovation. But he started this new trend in Basra, and his name was Ma'bad al-Juhani. So he says that I, as well as Humaid bin Abdul Rahman al-Himyari, that was his friend, we went, both of us, we did Hajj or Umrah. It's in, uh, in Sahih Muslim, there's a there's, uh, shak. So either it was Hajj or Umrah. Uh, they both went. And we said to each other that if we are able to meet some Sahaba of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that would be great because we could ask him about this individual, Ma'abad al-Juhani, who started talking about fate and started saying different things about fate uh, that we were not aware of. So we said that we would be happy if we met someone. And we could ask him about what this individual is saying. So we were lucky enough to meet Abdullah bin Umar bin al-Khattab. So Abdullah bin Umar, they saw him when they went to Mecca. Or it was Medina. Dakhilan al-Masjid. So he was going to the Masjid and they saw him going to the Masjid. So they were very lucky. So I and my friend, so Yahya bin Ya'mur is saying, myself as well as Humaid, we surrounded Abdullah bin Umar. One of us was on his right. The other was on his left. I felt that my friend would hand over the, the, the speech to me, meaning that he wouldn't want to speak and he would want me to speak. So I began to speak. And I said, O oh, father of Abdurrahman, Aba Abdurrahman, uh, there, has, there are people that have been, uh, you know, that have come amongst us. People that have risen amongst us. He's referring to Basra and those people who speak about Qadr. They recite the Quran and they seek knowledge. And then Yahya ibn Ya'mur spoke about them. So he said that they read Quran, they seek knowledge, and he spoke about good things about them. And then he said they believe that there is no fate. And things just happen the way they are. There's no such thing as fate. So then Abdullah bin Umar, he said, if you meet these people, then tell them that I am free from them. I have nothing to do with them. And they have nothing to do with me. 
I have nothing to do with them. They have nothing to do with me. That's what Abdullah bin Umar said. And then he said, uh, Abdullah bin Umar said that if one of them, those who say this about Qadr, about fate, that there is no such thing as fate in Basra, if they were to spend gold the size of Mount Uhud, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not accept that from them unless they believe in Qadr. So you can do whatever you want. You can believe, I mean, you know, whatever you want. But if you don't believe in Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to accept your amal. Then Abdullah bin Umar said, my father, Umar bin al-Khattab, he said, and this is where the hadith, hadith begins. And I'm going to translate the hadith. We were sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa one day when a person with extremely white clothing and extremely dark hair came upon us. We could not see any effect of travel on him and none of us knew him. And he sat right next to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He connected his knees to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's knees the way they were sitting. And he placed his hands on Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's knees. And he said, oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Islam is that you bear witness that there is no God other than Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And you establish salah and you pay zakah and you fast in Ramadan and you do hajj of the Kaaba, tahujjul bayt, meaning you do hajj if you are able to do so, meaning if you have financial ability and all the other different types of abilities that is required for hajj, you have to do hajj as well. The person said, you have told the truth. So we were very shocked. Remember Umar radiallahu anhu saying, we were very shocked at this person who came and asked this to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's asking him and then he says, you are correct. The person then said, tell me about iman. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is that you believe in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and the day of judgment, the last day, and you believe in qadr or fate, the good and the bad. The person said, you have told the truth. Then the person asked Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again, tell me about ihsan. What is ihsan? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see him. If you cannot see him, then know that he sees you. Then the person said, tell me about a sa'a or the hour, referring to qiyamah. Tell me about qiyamah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the person who was questioned does not know any more than the questioner. Meaning, you're asking me, I don't know, just like you don't know. The person then asked, tell me about the signs. If you're not going to tell me about sa'a, qiyama, tell me about the signs of qiyama. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is when a woman gives birth to her master. And it is also when you see people who have no clothing, uh, they are very destitute and poor. They are shepherds. And these people with no clothing, who don't have shoes, who are poor, they will compete with each other in building large buildings. Then the person left. The questioner, he left. Then Umar says that we, we stood there for a while. He's referring to himself and the Sahaba. We just stood there. After this person left, we were just there. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, Oh Umar, do you know who the questioner was? I said, Allah and his messenger know best. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said, That was Jibreel. He came to teach you your deen. This is recorded by Imam Muslim. So this was the hadith. This is the second hadith in Arba'i Nawawi. And as we said before, this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. However, it's in a very uh, short form. This form that we have before us is what is in uh, Sahih Muslim. 
And that introduction portion about the two meeting Abdullah bin Umar, that is in the actual Sahih Muslim, not in the Arba'in Nawawi. If you want to see the full hadith with that, that extra portion uh, in the beginning, then you would have to look at Arba'in. Uh, I'm sorry, you'd have to look at the actual uh, Sahih Muslim. Okay, so now that we have uh, translated this, now we can, just one second, I'm trying to pull up uh, something. Okay. Let's move on. This is the translation we just did. Okay, the importance of this hadith. We already covered this in the previous lesson. Talked about how this talks about the three major categories of, of deen itself. Islam, Iman, Ihsan, and in reality. And then we spoke about Imam Ibn Rajab Hanbali's uh, statement about this. How this is essentially... Uh, anyone that speaks about deen, any affair in deen, any matter in deen is going to be talking about something uh, that this hadith encompasses. So now let's learn from the lessons of this hadith. Now, number one, the first lesson we can take from this hadith. If we look at before the, Arba, the hadith that is featured in Arba'i Nawawi, but that, that, that portion which is in Sahih Muslim, we can take lessons from that portion as well meaning the, the whole incident with Yahya ibn Ya'mur and uh, Humaid and how they met Abdullah ibn Umar and they asked him the questions. We can take some lessons from there as well. So the first lesson we can take from this is the danger of bid'ah. So what was happening in Basra? These two individuals came from Basra, which is in Iraq. Uh, there was a person over there named Ma'bad al-Juhani and he started a bid'ah or an innovation. And there is a hadith coming in Arba'in Nawawi in which we will talk more in depth about what is an innovation, what constitutes an innovation. But briefly, this person was saying something uh, and he started a thing that was not present in Islam before. So what was he saying? He was saying that there is no fate. What drove this individual to say that? He was uh, battling with a theological issue that was basically, he couldn't understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything and has everything written in the Lawh al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows absolutely everything, and still we have free will. He couldn't, he couldn't deal with that issue, so he was battling with that issue. Uh, you know, if I do something, how can I have free will if Allah already knows it? That's what he was dealing with. And his conclusion was that Allah doesn't know. There is no fate. That was his conclusion. So because that was such a radical thing, and that has nothing to do with Islam, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not teach that. Uh, this is the bid'ah that started. So the lesson we can learn from this is that when there are few scholars to check the condition of the ummah, then the doors for bid'ah open up. What was happening in Basra, perhaps there were few ulama there. There were not enough ulama, there were not enough sahaba there to show this individual that you are incorrect. To help them and to steer everyone away from that bid'ah. And because there were few ulama there, not that there weren't any ulama, but less ulama than in Mecca and Medina, this person started getting a following. And that's why these two individuals had to come all the way uh, when they came for Hajj or Umrah to meet one of the sahaba. So that shows us how important it is that we need scholars in every uh, area where we live. Wherever we have Muslims, we require scholars to be there. Otherwise, we fall prey to the tricks of shaitan. And shaitan, his favorite thing to do is to start bid'at. He loves to start bid'at because a person will think they're doing the right thing, whereas they're doing something completely uh, you know, fabricated in deen. And they'll never correct their ways. There will always be a fight between truth and falsehood. It is the responsibility of the scholars to address innovations and bring people back to the truth. The ulama know what is a bid'ah. The ulama know what is true Islam. That is basically their job. So whereas normal people, they won't really know that they're following into this bid'ah. They believe that what they are doing is correct. They believe that they are getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
the only the real ulama would really know that this is incorrect this is has no basis in deen this has no substantiation in quran or hadith so because of that we require ulama to be in in every society and that should also really impress upon us the importance of gaining knowledge each one of us perhaps we're not ulama perhaps we don't fit in that cat category of ulama but if we gain the knowledge of deen then we can point out to people that look brother or look sister this what you are doing is a bid'ah is, is an innovation so it's quite important that we gain knowledge so that we can steer away steer ourselves away and people as well from bid'ah the second lesson we can take from this hadith is seeking the counsel of ulama when a person began making claims in Ma'bad al-Juhani in, in Basra, these two individuals, Yahya and Yahya ibn Ya'mur and Humaid, they were very concerned. So they traveled from Iraq to Mecca or Medina, it doesn't specify, to seek out the Sahaba. They knew that the Sahaba were the greatest ulama. They took the deen from Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They understood deen way more than anyone else. So if anyone knew the answer, if this person was telling the truth or not, it was definitely the Sahaba. So they went for the sake of Hajj or Umrah, but however, this was also on their minds. Like, you know, you go for a specific pers purpose. This is not, you know, conflicting with their niyyah of Hajj or Umrah. They're going for Hajj, they're going for Umrah. However, this is on the back of their minds that, hey, we're going, going to meet some of the Sahaba. We should have uh, something planned out. We should have some questions ready. Number one, this shows the importance of always resorting to the ulama. Whenever we have an issue, we should always approach the ulama. If it's a very basic issue that can be answered by, uh, you know, looking at a book or, you know, yeah, very easy, go to YouTube and find, you know, the fara'il of wudu, fara'il of salah, different things like that, then that's, that's fine. You don't have to approach ulama for very basic masail issues like that. However, if it's an actual difficult issue or a problem that we're having and we seek guidance, then definitely we should approach the ulama because they are supposed to have the answers. So instead of, you know, if it's a difficult masala, we're talking about, you know, intricacies of ibadat, worship, or uh, marital issues, you know, the masail regarding that, or business issues, or any other types of you know, intricate masal that general people don't know, then instead of you know, searching for answers on Google or just approaching a fatwa website, which they do, alhamdulillah, these, these are great sources of, of knowledge and these fatwa websites are tremendously beneficial. However, it could be an incorrect fatwa or it could be for a specific situation that we're not understanding. So the best course of action is to approach a scholar. So a scholar meaning someone that our society recognizes as a person of knowledge, someone that we know and we trust as a person of knowledge, we should always approach someone we trust. If this person is a great scholar, everyone says he's a great scholar, but for some reason we don't trust this person's knowledge, then we don't have to go to that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has made so many ulama, they're all over the place. So we should approach someone that we do trust. So these two individuals, they went and they saw, they trusted all of the Sahaba. As we could see in the Hadith, they said that if we find any of the Sahaba, and they found one of the greatest, Abdullah bin Umar was known to be amongst the greatest of the Sahaba in terms of his knowledge, uh, narrating almost the most Hadith after uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, was a great scholar of the Ummah. So the point here is that whenever we have issues, we should approach the ulama. So that is, uh, we have to seek their counsel. Another lesson that we learn from this is respect for the scholars of deen. Now, how did these, these two tabi'is, they were tabi'in because they were alive in the time of Sahaba. They found Ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, and they approached him with honor and respect. Remember in the hadith, they, they surrounded him. Now, this is not a disrespectful surrounding. This is a surrounding of humility. So a person comes on your right and another person comes on your left. This actually shows their love for him and that they were comfortable around him. If they were uncomfortable around him, then 
they wouldn't approach him in that manner. They would, uh, you know, have to, they would ask another person to be the middleman to approach Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. They wouldn't have gone directly towards him. It seems like perhaps they even knew him from before or they were just really close to him uh, because of what they knew about him. And they approached him and uh, with that honor and respect. And despite their love for him, so we can see that they loved him because of, you know, them one on the right, one on the left. They both wanted to be as close as possible. If both of them were standing on the right, then one would be farther away from the other. Then, you know, he would feel bad that, you know, my friend is closer to Abdullah bin Umar. This individual who is the son of Umar bin al-Khattab, who has seen Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, touched Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They, were, they had that fervor. They wanted to get as close as possible. So one was on the right. He probably got there first. He got on the right. The other one got on the left. They didn't want anything in between. They had uh, the great Sahabi Abdullah bin Umar in between. And so that, that, that shows their love for him and their fervor to get as close as possible to the Sahaba. Anhum. On top of this, not only did they love him, but it was, it was juxtaposed, meaning it, it was, uh, you had one side of comfort and love. And then on the other side, it was a lot of reverence. So they had this, this amazing balance that on one side, you have comfort, love, uh, feeling free and open with the Sahaba. And on the other side, you had, you know, a great amount of respect, a great amount of reverence. So th there is a definite balance that we have to have. When we approach ulama, seniors who have served, uh, you know, the community who have served, the deen who have taught us since we were children, and, you know, now they have, they're you know advanced in age or they're you know they're doing the khidma of deen we should have we should keep this in mind there's de a definite balance you cannot be so uh, open with them that you know you just joke with them and say things that you would say in front of anyone else right there has to be some barriers because they're ulama they're ulama respecting them is a sign of deen they are amongst the signs of deen so this is a great uh, thing that we have to do in one hadith Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says uh, you know amongst others he, he uh, says different uh, things in this hadith where if a person does not respect the youth show respect for the elderly and show reverence for the ulama then he's not amongst us there is there is a hadith where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa says this so we have to revere the scholars we should be open with them we shouldn't treat them like you know like they're super high on a pedestal they're human beings definitely However, there should be some sort of respect that we show. Just like these two individuals came, they had that balance. They had love, honor, and respect for him. But at the same time, they were kind of awestruck as well. And we can see this that, you know, when um, uh, Humaid, he, he kind of made like an ishara, like a sign towards Yahya ibn Ya'mur that, you know, I'm not going to say anything. I'm too awestruck right now. We're standing in front of Abdullah ibn Umar. They've heard stories about him. They knew he was really famous. I mean, imagine, it's a Sahabi, but he's like one of the, the top Sahaba. So they made a sign towards each other that, you know, I'm not going to, uh, who made it, I'm not going to speak to him. You go ahead and speak to him. So they were awestruck. So that's how we should be with the ulama. Not that we cannot approach them, but when we do approach them, we should have that in mind that, you know, we want to be open with them. We want to be clear with them. We want to show our love. However, we should know our boundaries as well because these are, you know, in our minds, they should be the people of Allah. We shouldn't second guess them unless obviously there are blatant signs and everything like that. That's another issue. But we should give them the benefit of the doubt from the beginning and have that reverence and, and respect for them. So this is something that we can learn, that respect that these two individuals had. They wanted to get as close as possible to him because they loved him, but they were also awestruck because, you know, they wanted to know who's going who's gonna to speak to him because that was a very difficult thing. Okay. So that was the third lesson. Number four, having mashwara before time and taking initiative. So what does this mean? These two tabi'een, they didn't make mashwara beforehand. As we saw just now, they, they made an ishara at that moment. They made a sign. They made an indication at the moment. Okay, who's going to speak? Because Yahya ibn Ya'mur says, uh, 
I felt that my friend would, would, you know, hand over the mic to me that I would have to speak. So they didn't really make a mashwara beforehand, mashwara meaning a, a, a meeting or, you know, going over, you know, who's going to do what beforehand. So we could take a reverse lesson from this. They didn't do it, but they, they were very quick in that at the last moment, you know, he made, a, he made an indication and Yahya knew. So then he started speaking. So they were very intelligent. But we can take a lesson from this and say that when we have to approach ulama, we should think beforehand, make a mashwara. Okay, and, and we should also do this, like, you know, schedule a meeting with ulama, right? We can't expect the alim to come to us. Just like the two tabi'een, they went to Abdullah bin Umar. We should also try sometimes to visit our local scholars. Uh, they're great gems, uh, you know, in front of us. People who have been, you know, engaged in knowledge, engaged in, you know, propagating the deen and deep practice as well have such a deep connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala locally. Our ulama here, very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should make it a point to try to, to, to go and visit them. And when we do so, we shouldn't just go like, you know, hey, Imam, can, can we come meet you? And then the Imam says, yeah, sure. When we go there, we have nothing to say. So then we end up speaking about nonsense. We should actually sit down. And I actually had an experience with a very good friend of mine we graduated from our university, our madrasa, and we were studying in a different madrasa. So we came to visit, and we were going to visit the, the Shaykh al Hadith, the, the, the basically the, you know, the greatest teacher in the madrasa, the university. Uh, a great, uh, what I believe to be a wali of Allah, a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So before we were going to visit him, we actually sat down in one of the old classrooms and both of us were just silent and we were just thinking of what we can talk to him about what questions can we ask him what kind of things can we benefit from him and so when we approached him then we had those things in mind and you know he, he is a great uh, wali of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i believe so he he won't speak unless you you ask him questions so he wasn't very um you know he won't ask you about how you're doing and everything he will he will do basic uh, you know, kalam, like, you know, how is everything like that? But you won't go too deep uh, in conversation. So we had to sit down and we thought of interesting things we can talk to him about. So we should have mashwara beforehand and discuss that when we do visit the scholar, we should have something to say. What are the things that we can benefit from him? And then when we go there, we'll have an objective and we'll have something to talk about and something we can benefit from. And this is exactly what these two tabi'een did. They went and they were going for Umrah or Hajj. So when they went, they said that if we can meet a Sahabi, we can ask about this. So that was some sort of mashwara beforehand. But the other mashwara that they didn't do was who will be the speaker. So you can, you can prepare beforehand before meeting one of these uh, scholars, imams. We can make a list of things that we want to discuss. Uh, and then we can have a really fruitful discussion with these imams. So there's, these are certain adab, and adab are priceless, really. Uh, a lot of times we focus on, uh, you know, fiqh. We focus on the deep uh, knowledge of deen, and we forget these etiquettes. Adab are etiquettes, and these are what really make a person, uh, you know, a true believer, a true Muslim, has, is, is beautified by these etiquettes. So... I'm just reading point number four. The two tabi'is did not make a mashwara as to who will be the speaker, but they did make a mashwara regarding what they will talk about. And they realized that both cannot speak at, the, at once because that would be disrespectful. Also, we can't obviously both speak at once. One person will have to be the speaker. So the speaker, who was Yahya, he realized that he would have to do it because of certain qualities he had. He knew uh, because they were very close friends he automatically knew that my friend would hand it over to me. And that was perhaps because he had certain qualities. He was a better speaker. He knew how to articulate himself or he knew about the situation more. He knew about uh, Ma'bad al-Juhani more. So he took the initiative and he explained their situation. So that's another lesson we can take that to take initiative. Uh, you know, they're both awestruck. This was Abdullah bin Umar. 
However, he knew that he could not let that affect him. If he was just there and, and you know, starstruck in front of the Sahabi, then Abdullah ibn Umar would just stare at them and then say salam and then leave. So they had to take advantage of that situation. So we also need to take advantage of our situations. If we sometimes are in a situation and we feel like, you know, someone else could do uh, the, the action, but we also can do it and we have the certain qualifications to do that action, we should put ourselves forward. At times, we also have to realize that if we're able to do an action, then we should put ourselves forward for the good of the jama'ah. So Yahya knew in order for him to benefit as well as Humayd, as well as all the people in Iraq, they needed the answer. So these people were, you know, in a very important position because they would take and relay that information that Abdullah bin Umar gave them, go back to Basra, their hometown, and spread that information. So this is something very important, making mashwara before we meet someone. Uh, and, you know, other lessons are that, you know, we should try to meet our uh, imma. Uh, all of us are weak in that regard. Uh, I myself am very weak in that regard. We have great scholars, great shuyukh in the area who deserve our attention. And uh, we should just even just sit in their company. I had a friend actually um, who was the khadim or he used to do uh, khidma, meaning he used to serve that Shaykh al-Hadith. And he told me that, you know, you should come often. I see that you don't really come to his house. So after Asr, that Shaykh would be free and he would sit and the visitors could come. Anyone could come and speak to him and, and ask him questions. So my friend was always there and he told me that you should come. And I said that I have nothing to say, you know, and he won't speak to me because you'll just ask me my name and then it will just be awkward. I have nothing to say. He has nothing to say. And I'm just like awestruck in front of him. What do I do? So my friend said that, don't worry about asking him anything. Just sit there. Other people will come. They'll ask questions. But the fact that you're there, there is a spiritual connection that's happening. And he, he told me something very profound. He said that this is, you know, a very, very pious person. So it is as if like a waterfall of nur is just falling on him. And this was a, an example that my friend gave. A waterfall of nur falling on this sheikh. Obviously, we can't see it. But the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely with him. This is a person who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, spends day and night reading and you know, studying deen, teaching deen, and worshiping Allah. So as if a waterfall of nur is pouring on this individual, if you sit in the vicinity of that waterfall, definitely there's going to be some splashes, some you know, drops of water that are going to get on you. So you're, you're going to have a positive it's going to have a positive effect on you if you're in his, his company. So that was basically what he said to me. Okay, let's move on. Uh, number five, asking questions in, a, in the correct manner. So how is this seen in, in this situation? <clears throat> We're still discussing the whole situation between Yahya ibn Umar, Humayd and Ibn Umar. So Yahya ibn Umar began his his addressing or he began addressing ibn umar anhu by his kunya so if you if you guys remember what he said he said ya Aba abdi rahman so for the arabs to call them by their first name was a bit disrespectful if someone is senior then we cannot use their first name that was in the arab culture uh, depending on our culture we should follow uh, whatever is is considered uh, adab considered a part of etiquette if our culture dictates that uh, using the first name of an individual is disrespectful then we should have a title uh, in honorific before that or address the person properly so the first thing Yahya ibn Ya'mud did is he said Ya Aba Abdir Rahman he didn't say Ya Ibn Umar he said Oh Abu Abdir Rahman meaning you are the father of Abdir Rahman that was his son Ibn Umar's son so that was the first thing he did so he, Yahya ibn Ya'mur was an intelligent person. He knew how to, uh, you know, approach the situation. And that's probably why his friend kind of, you know, handed over the situation to him. He then, the second thing he did was he spoke of the good qualities of the people who started an innovation. So uh, Ma'bad al-Juhani was in Basra. He had a strong following. And these people were denying fate which is like, you know, a tenant of deen. Like if, if you 
deny that you're not really a Muslim. But what, what he said was, these people recite Quran, these people seek knowledge, and then he started mentioning all of the good things about these people. Only after, and in the hadith, it just says those two things, and he says, uh, uh, So he mentioned many different things, good things about these people. So this is really important because this is a tabi'i. He basically learned from the sahaba who learned from Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa When you approach someone, you shouldn't, and, and you have a question regarding another individual. Best thing is don't speak about another person behind their back, obviously. That's backbiting. We shouldn't do that. However, in this situation, it's not considered backbiting because this is to learn a masala and to inform a sahabi about what's happening in the ummah. So it wasn't backbiting. However, look how beautifully he, he approached him and he started with his good qualities. They recite Quran, they attain knowledge, and then he mentioned other good traits. Only after doing what's called a, a tazkiyah or, or speaking good about these people, then he said, and they say that there is no fate. So he brought that up at the end. So that's, you know, that, that, that speaks volumes about how we should address issues. Nowadays, you know, we approach people and the first thing that comes out of our mouth is, is negativity about another person that's not there. We can take a lesson from this. He only mentioned uh, Ma'abad al-Juhani and the others. And if you notice, he didn't really take his name he didn't say like, oh, there's a guy, Ma'abad al-Juhani. He said there are people. So he's not, he's not even saying his name. This is a lot of adab, a lot of etiquette that we're taking from the tabi'een. Uh, we can make it, you know, mubham or, you know, ambiguous. And also notice that Abdullah bin Umar didn't say, who, who is that? Tell me who it is so I can deal with him. He didn't say any of that. He said, let them know that I am free from them and they are free from me. Neither was the questioner trying to get into unnecessary things, you know, taking people's names and getting involved in, you know, talking trash about them behind their backs, nor was Abdullah bin Umar talking about that either. So both of them, you know, mashallah, today we see the complete opposite. If the questioner comes and the questioner doesn't want to say the name, first of all, you know, a lot of times we as questioners, we approach someone, uh, we say, oh, this so-and-so did this and this. So we automatically say the person's name. If in the, you know, we don't say the person's name, then the person that we are asking, they're like, oh, who, who is that? Just, just tell me who that is. And if we say, no, you know, I want to keep that person ambiguous, the person would be like, oh, um, I need to know so that I can give you a proper answer. So that's completely unnecessary. This is asking in a correct manner. He had all of this in his mind, or he built it in himself to have this good character. So just by asking a question, we can see so much adab and so much character in Yahya ibn Yamur. So only after speaking about the accolades of these people, he then presented their fault, which was that they are not, they, they do not believe in fate. And he also explained the entire situation. That's really important as well. So he didn't hide details because sometimes when we approach someone, approach a scholar, approach an imam, and we have a question, at times it's very biased. Why is that? Because we are telling our story and we're not telling all the full details. And when we hide details, we get a biased answer. We get the answer that we want. We have to be honest. We have to tell the entire situation, just like Yahya ibn Ya'mur did. And then, then the mufti or uh, you know, the imam or whoever can give a proper answer. So these are all etiquettes of asking and approaching ulama. Number six. Now we move on to Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. So we learn so much from Yahya ibn Ya'mur just by asking a question. And this is why it's so beautiful to study the lives of the Salaf, the first three generations, the Sahaba, Tabi'een, Atba'u Tabi'een. Uh, there are many books dedicated to this. Uh, an excellent book, um, Seer Alam Nubala. It's an Arabic book. It's extremely large. It's an encyclopedia of these generations, like not just the first three generations, but more than that. Imam al Zahabi, he wrote this book as a biography of many people. He starts with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Khulafa, he starts with the Sahaba, then he talks about the Tabi'een, Atba'u Tabi'een. He goes all the way to his time, which was in the 700s, uh, Hijri. And it's very in depth, and there's so much benefit in just studying the lives of these people. Uh, 
in every one of their statements as well as every one of their actions there's there's just hidaya and you know there are still people like that in the world we we feel like you know there's very few people there's few, very few awliya left who have these adab who have these etiquettes they're still around alhamdulillah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me that you know that gift that i have seen these people with my eyes that they speak very little but just their movements will speak volumes the things they do is just like your life will change just by just looking at them and this uh you know this is reflected in the tabi'in as well there was a certain tabi'i people would he would have lessons and these lessons would be in hadith and fiqh so there would be thousands of people that would come and only like 10 20 30 you know in the tens were people with ink pots and paper so a person was uh, relating the story that there's this great tabi'i or great scholar and he's narrating hadith but there's very few people that are writing the hadith down and he was asked what do everyone else do and he replied that they just come to look at him they want to see how he behaves how he acts because that to them was one step closer to rasulullah sallallahu so just i mean the ulama the real ulama you know may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to emulate them. They are just really like, you know, stars, shining lights because they embody the sunnah. They, they make themselves a manifestation of Quran and hadith. So we were saying that uh, Abdullah bin Umar, radiallahu anhuma, he didn't praise these individuals because Yahya ibn Ya'mur was just praising them. He said they recite Quran, they do this, they do dhikr, they, they uh, attain knowledge. But what did Abdullah bin Umar do? He, as a mufti or answering the question, did something very amazing. He got right to the point. He didn't give a whole, you know, introduction and all these extra points. He just said the answer. This is exactly what you want. This is the answer. So he didn't praise the individuals. Rather, he went directly to the point in his answer. And what was that? He said, nothing is going to benefit these people if they don't have correct iman. So that's also something really important. If we're put in a position where, you know, we're asked or we, we have certain knowledge and people are asking us about Masail, we shouldn't make an extremely long answer, something so complicated that at the end, uh, you know, the, the questioner didn't get it. And that's, that's exactly what happened with uh, Jibreel alayhi salam and, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Look at the, the way Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam answered him, the most beautiful. And these are examples of Jawami al kalim meaning, uh, you know, very concise speech with that can volumes can be written upon it. And uh, Jibreel asked him, What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? When is Qiyamah? What are the signs? And Nabi Sallallahu spoke very briefly. And we'll see just in our small sharh, our small explanation, how much we can derive from that. So, look, Abdullah bin Umar is doing the same thing. He answered and he just said one statement. He said, They're not going to benefit. And he gave an example. Just like we saw in Inna Mal Amal Bin Niyat, you say something theoretical, you give an example to clear it up. He said the same thing. They're not going to benefit. What was the example? If they spent Mount Uhud, amount of gold, Allah's not going to accept it until they believe in Qadr. And then, as a citation and proof to that point, he quoted a hadith he heard from his father. So, uh, we can finish with the last point here is the severity of bid'ah. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he knew the importance of unity and brotherhood amongst Muslims. I mean, he heard all of the ahadith, all of the ayat in the Quran. He was a great scholar of Islam. He knew how important brotherhood and unity is. Many ahadith where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa stressed unity, where he said that if the, the entire ummah is like one body, if someone hurts you, uh, if you have a headache, then the entire body is not going to feel good. So there's so many ahadith, so many things talking about unity. So why did Ibn Umar say that, you know, they're not, they have nothing to do with me, I have nothing to do with them. That is because how severe bid'ah is. When they introduced this new thing in deen, had nothing to do with our religion. Ibn Umar, he as a sahabi, as a person who took his deen from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he knew that he had a responsibility to protect deen. And he said, I have nothing to do with them. They have nothing to do with me. Spread that message. And we need to stop this. We need to nip it in the bud. 
and make sure this doesn't spread. So he knew the importance of unity and brotherhood. However, when it came to this issue of faith, he was unapologetic and he answered according to the dictates of the situation. So there's just so many lessons, more than what we have mentioned here. We can just go back and, and look at this hadith and this story and just derive so many etiquettes, so many adab, so many lessons. And this is the beauty of hadith, really. If you open up Sahih Bukhari or open up these different collections of hadith, I mean, you can spend your entire life just deriving benefit from it. And that's why it's important to read. I mean, the first revelation that came was Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq, recite in the name of your Lord who has created. Uh, it's really important that we read because we don't have that connection with the Sahaba. We don't have connection with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except through what is written down. But we do have connection with those who are alive, so we should also try our best to visit these shuyukh, these ulama, and like we said, make mashwara about what we will discuss and really try to benefit from them while they're alive. You know, what's the point of crying over the fact that they passed away when they do pass away? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them long and blessed lives so that we can benefit. When they pass away, then everyone cries, oh, he was a great scholar. But what benefit did we really take from them? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us, give us tawfiq to benefit really from these ahadith that we're studying and from the practical examples, these living people that are alive in front of us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our search of knowledge and give us tawfiq to apply it in our lives and finally to disseminate and spread that knowledge to others as well. Jazakumullah khairan. Akhir dawan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.